This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. Is uh, not a single lawyer in this country who has had a more profound impact on campaign finance law than has James Bopp. Mr. Bopp was the lawyer behind the uh, Citizens United case, which ultimately led to the Supreme Court decision that made it possible for corporations and unions to independently spend unlimited amounts of money to support the political candidates of their choice. Uh, Mr. Bopp also figured prominently in. Bush v. Gore, uh, which in no small way determined the outcome of a presidential election 13 years ago. He also argued and won a case before the U.S. Supreme Court called Republican Party of Minnesota versus White, which in many states changed the way judicial elections are conducted. And all of that doesn't even begin, doesn't even begin to describe the work he has done for the last 35 years as general counsel of the National Right to Life. Uh, nor does it describe all the work he's done for the Republican Party and his current job as special counsel to the Republican National Committee. I don't think it's an exaggeration uh, to say that among conservatives, he is widely viewed as a living legend at this point. I also think uh, it's probably fair to say that at the other end of the political spectrum, the left-wing liberal end of that spectrum, he is often portrayed as the prince of darkness. James Bob, welcome to Legally Speaking. Thank you. Wow, what an introduction. I, I was being slightly <laughs> facetious about the prince of darkness part, but it is is true, is it not, that uh, uh, the kind of work that you do and what you've managed to accomplish over the course of your rather extraordinary career uh, does uh, uh, generate a lot of strong feelings, correct? Uh, true enough. I have been involved in a number of controversial issues in, on a national level, and, uh, and, and some of the cases I've won have, have, have as you described, had a profound effect. And uh, for better or worse, I am. Uh, Credited with that, but uh, honestly, it's the judges that write the opinions, not the lawyers. So they deserve the credit, not me. Back in uh, January of 2010, uh, you told the New York Times that you had a 10 year plan to quote, and I'll just read the quote here dismantle the entire regulatory regime that is called campaign finance law. Now, my understanding is that after the quote appeared, you acknowledged that there was no 10 year plan. Uh, but let's say there was or is a 10-year plan, and this is a trick question, but I'm going to ask it anyway. Say there, there was such a plan, uh, wouldn't you now be ahead of schedule? Uh, I think we're on schedule, actually. <laughs> the, uh, but I, I said that to the New York Times kind of in jest, and uh, uh, because uh, if I was referring to anything, I was referring to what was in my mind or is in my mind, because I... Yeah, I think about uh, cases and how they fit in uh, the, court, the Supreme Court's agenda and uh, how one builds upon another. And uh, some, some cases, such as Citizens United, was expressly and specifically built on the victory we had in Wisconsin Right to Life. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and now we, we have a case I'll be arguing on, on contribution limits uh, in, in, in October in the Supreme Court. and and. Uh, aspects of it are built upon the case I won 
uh, Randall versus Sorrell, which struck down a Vermont's low contribution limit. So, yeah. so I do think about so you how don't have a ten-year plan, but you're on schedule with the plan that you don't have. That, that so, I don't have. does that mean, in fact, you do have a plan? Well, you know, you could say this becomes this is almost existential. Yeah, yeah it is. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I, I didn't really have a ten-year plan that specific, uh -huh. uh, but. Uh, what I was saying is I thought that it was, uh, it was uh, certainly plausible that within 10 years from that, uh, from the decision in Wisconsin, the first decision in Wisconsin Right to Life, mm -hmm. which was in 19, uh, 2005, uh, we won the thing on the merits in 2007, but uh, that it's perfectly plausible that from that merits decision that uh, it would, uh, uh, we could see the Supreme Court dismantle the, all, all the justifications for campaign finance reform in 10 years, and we are on track mm -hmm. to do that. Mm -hmm. You know, when I read your comments over the years, uh, it, it occurs to me that you are to campaign finance what Wayne LaPierre of the NRA is to guns. And what I mean by that is just as Wayne LaPierre argues that the more guns that we have in our society and the fewer restrictions there are on those guns, the safer we all are, you are arguing, are you not, that the more money there is sloshing around our political system and the fewer regulations there are on that money, the healthier our democracy? Is that a fair analogy? Well, I don't know what you mean by sloshing around. Sloshing is slightly pejorative. Yeah, it is. Moving, it's circulating around. No, I, uh, I don't think it's the proper verb? I don't think we ought to use it as bribes uh, for I, candidates. I never use the word Slosh, bribe. Well, but sloshing around. Circulating? Uh, is circulating. That okay? uh, uh, what, was, what verb would you use? Uh, uh, using for campaign speech. That's what I would use. Okay. Because every, di of that. every dime that we, we are seeking to protect, uh, whether it's a contribution to a candidate or a political party or a PAC, or it's independent speech by all those entities, or it's protection of issue advocacy by any group, right. uh, all of those things are speech. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, so that, that's what the First Amendment protects. And the more of it is we have, the better. Speech. The more of it we have, the better. Yes. There's no logic, uh, no limitation to that logic. No, no, well, th there's a practical limitation. It is true that uh, the, uh, at a certain point of saturation, yeah. uh, you're... Uh, Wasting your money. You're, well. Well, yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> your, your, your marginal returns are starting to really decrease. Right. So, so no one uh, budgets an unlimited amount of money even if they have an unlimited amount of money to convey a message because uh, at a certain point they're wasting their money. Yeah. So, so to, I, I know the reformers always like to speak about unlimited, but you know, that practically that's ridiculous. No one would do that. You're a, a native of Terre Haute, Indiana, mm -hmm. and that's at least one thing, perhaps the only thing, that you uh, share in common with Eugene Debs. <laughs> uh, this is that uh, early 20th century uh, politician mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. who ran for president several times as a socialist. Mm -hmm. I believe one of those times he ran was from his prison cell. Mm -hmm. Flashing forward to our own time, do, do you really believe that Barack Obama is a socialist? Yes, uh, I certainly do. I think his uh, ideology is socialistic. Uh -huh. I mean, he, every element that, of the, uh, that we identify with a socialist uh, movement uh, he adheres to. He wants to do redistribution of wealth. He's very much in favor of the government taking over about everything that uh, is important, yeah. uh, certainly. Uh, he, he doesn't believe 100 percent in government solutions uh -huh. uh, to, to things. So uh, a lot of the essential elements of a socialistic type view, but the, I mean there's a lot of variations right. within that, you know, that broad category. Uh, but he, he adheres to. So, yes. So, he, by that definition, have, uh, let's say with the exception of Ronald Reagan, have all our post-World War II presidents been socialists? No, not at all. Franklin Roosevelt? Certainly, right? Uh, that's questionable, I think. Really? 
Yes, I mean, I, I agree that he wanted a bigger role for government, but he didn't want an all-encompassing role. You think, you, you view Barack Obama as a bigger socialist than Franklin Roosevelt? Definitely. Even though... It's Ideologically in, true. Even yes. though in 2010 he uh, agreed to, uh, actually it was 2011, he agreed to one and a half trillion cuts to the federal uh, the, the, those, spending. Those, those were cuts in growth, those weren't cuts. Uh -huh. You don't live in Washington, D.C. You know in Washington, D.C. a cut is a cut in growth. You don't live in Washington, D.C. You don't have to buy into that kind of BS rhetoric. Uh -huh. But that's a significant <laughs> amount of money, and John Boehner uh, boasted after he agreed to those cuts that, you know, he got a good deal. They were paltry, bo uh, uh, cuts in growth. That's uh -huh. not cut in government. Uh -huh. What about Richard Nixon? No, definitely not. He, uh, proposed... Definitely not. He proposed a more ambitious health care plan than uh, Barack Obama did. He wanted a guaranteed income for the poor. Uh, I didn't he say that. Wage price I, didn't freeze. Say, I didn't say I agreed with everything Nixon uh, did. In fact, I supported uh, Ronald Reagan in 68 and, and 72 and 76 and, mm -hmm. and finally in 2000. So uh, I didn't say I supported everything any, any of these people have done. I'm just talking about their general philosophy of government. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, it's quite clear that uh, uh, Obama has, uh, has adhered to what he learned as a young man, uh, you know, at the, at the knee of, uh, of, of his Reverend Wright and, and, and uh, uh, some of his mentors at the time, uh, Solinsky, uh, Alinsky, I'm sorry, I mean, so the rules for risk. Yeah. Yeah. You know, you, you can see him play out the rules for radicals, uh, which was the manual for community organizers at the time that he was a community organizer. I, I know that you're uh, uh, an opponent of Obamacare, mm -hmm. but do you view health care as a right as opposed to being a simply what, viewed as a What does a right mean? What do you mean a right? I mean that, a legal right? Yeah, no. that if you don't have the uh, means to uh, afford the care you need to have... To, whether it's to deal with a life-threatening illness or to maintain a certain quality of life, you don't think that people have a, 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 a right to a, right a legal to, right? No. Yeah. No. no. I don't think they have a legal right to anything like that. I mean, to food if they're hungry or whatever. But I think there's a very profound obligation on, indivi on individuals uh, to to provide, you know, to provide charity and to ensure that uh, people uh, who are in real need uh, are uh, taken care of so that they, if they're, they're hungry, they're fed. Now, uh, I think that's best provided through private charity, uh, but I, uh, you know, I don't oppose laws that, that really do target those people. Uh, you know, of course, right now we have 42 million on food stamps, and that's ridiculous, mm -hmm. more than the people that are hungry in the United States. So. Uh, uh, it's become a, a, just a way of transferring wealth, uh, part of the Obama administration's uh, goal and policy is to transfer wealth from, from higher making people to lower making people and, and this is just one way that they're implementing it through a, a huge expansion of the food stamp program. Not because the people are hungry, uh, but because of they, they think they should have more money. Mm -hmm. but Obama thinks they should have more money. Mm -hmm. That's all. Well, you know, I'm glad you're talking about food stamps because I want to, you know, touch upon that as well. But, but uh, you know, with respect to health care, I mean, it, it's mm -hmm. something of a puzzle to me, and maybe you can help me to understand it. You know, there, there are any number of states where you have pro-life governors who uh, express a real reverence for life, and I have no reason at all to question that. But then they have turned around and have rejected the federal money that's available to them to expand Medicaid mm -hmm. to provide health coverage to their poorest citizens. And I guess I just don't understand that. Well, you know, a lot of liberals do not understand that uh, anything mm -hmm. about private charity yeah. and about the responsibilities that people have to provide uh, for private charity, that we each have an obligation to do that, to help our fellow man. They think that the only compassion is through government. And uh, uh, so that, that's the reason people misunderstand what uh, a governor would do in that situation. It's not that he's opposed to people being provided medical care. Mm -hmm. uh, he's opposed to partic a particular program, the effect, number one, who, who it applies to, and number 
Two, do, does it really apply to the needy? And number two is what other effects is it going to have? And of course, as we know, uh, you, when the uh, if they buy into that program, they also have to match it with state funds that uh, they can't afford. So, well, the first uh, two years, it, the federal government is going to pay 100 percent of the money, and then it gradually goes up to, to, to the year. Well, don't you think a responsible government governor ought to think beyond two years and when how it's going to be impact impact them? Well, I think at, in, at 2020, it, 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 the states each state would have to pay 10 percent. Still seems like a pretty good deal. Well, they don't think it is, and uh, uh, you know, at, at some point, we've got uh, w what's happening in America now is that government spending is is eating up private charity uh, because uh, number one, they're targeting the wealthy, and uh, the wealthy are uh, you know have have money to give, uh, and uh, number two is they're 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 really uh, advocating a, a view of of, of uh, charity, which is it, it's, and, and some leftists, you know, really believe it's illegitimate mm -hmm. for there to be private charity. They, they don't want. Uh, uh, Jamie Ripken is an example, a professor at, at uh, uh, George uh, Washington, who I debated recently, and he made this point. Mm -hmm. he, he doesn't want there to be charitable contributions because he wants the government to decide all charity. He's a real leftist, mm -hmm. and uh, but that's a point of view that. Is, is pretty prevalent in, on the liberal side of the spectrum, and that's why liberal probably one of the reasons why liberals give so little on uh, as far as private charity uh, is concerned. Conservatives give way more uh, per capita and uh, per, by percentage of income than do liberals. But in these conservative states, uh, you, if you look at the health statistics, the mortality rates, those conservative states that are rejecting this Medicaid expansion money are often doing less well than the rest of the country. Doesn't that concern you? Well, that's not necessarily related to what they spend on Medicaid. Why, why would you think that? Well, if they're not getting insurance and, well, so I mean, you, I, you, I, you that is a total coincidence. <laughs> like in, in, the, in the Medicare... Well, it's not coincidental. It, it is true yeah. that uh, the poorer states are more conservative yes. than the richer states. In fact, the richest states are liberal and uh, and they almost give no money in charity that, that is the, the the liberals that live there you know they almost give no money uh, they're at the very bottom of the of the you know 50 page yeah the 50 state list where the most conservative states are at the very top as far as per capita giving while their per capita income is the, is the exact opposite. So, I mean, when the Los Angeles Times did an analysis and found that, for example, colon cancer deaths are 16 percent higher in states opposing Medicaid expansion and, <laughs> de and deaths from breast, breast cancer are 8 percent higher, you don't feel Do you that, really you think that... My question is, you don't feel that accepting that Medicaid expansion money would improve this situation? That, that's a correlation. Right. That's not a causation. Well, you, so I mean, I mean, what is colon cancer caused by? I, I'm asking. It's you, caused by things like smoking. Well, and, and there are higher levels of smoking in those states. Right. True. But, also. Right. As well as having lower general income, that affects all sorts of things, such as your, your diet, which affects colon cancer. Preventative care, like regular yearly exams, can make a difference, right? In in terms of mortality. Uh, yeah, possibly. I mean, in a, but again, my but question. The, yeah. the, there's no causation here. The, 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 this is a you don't believe there's this, a you logical don't, you don't fallacy. Believe, you don't believe there's a causation between uh, expanding Medicare Be, no, and Medicaid. colon we're cancer. Talking about, we're talking no. about Medicaid. Okay. Uh, no, okay. I don't. So you don't think believe, there's a causation. So you don't believe then that governors accepting this money would improve the, these numbers that I'm citing? Well, it either uh, wouldn't, or it wouldn't to the extent that it's worth the cost, mm -hmm. or they can't afford their contribution. Okay. So it doesn't matter what the government is offering, they can't afford their contribution, well, then they can't afford their contribution. So they can't afford to accept it. What do you make of a, a RAND study that was done on Texas that showed that actually by refusing the money, Texans will end up spain, spending more money because they'll have to deal with the cost of all that uncompensated care. Uh, I, I don't know anything about a study like that, so how can I respond? Okay. 
uh, how can I, I don't know its methodology, I don't know how it came to that conclusion, or whether the day even supported that conclusion. How do you feel about Romneycare? Uh, I think it's different than Obamacare in yeah. critical, in a couple of critical ways that uh, certainly uh, meant that it ought to be looked at differently. It has uh, a mandate, right? It has a mandate. It, uh, it affects businesses. It affects businesses. It, uh, in fact, uh, I think Obamacare mandates that businesses uh, provide health insurance for uh, companies. Apparently that not. They just 50, waived it. Well, they're delaying it, right? <laughs> I'm trying to figure out how they do, do that when yeah. the statute says, you know, you're supposed to start today. Right. And there's no waivers anywhere in the statute. But Romney didn't delay it. And in his state, if you have just 11 employees, you have to provide health insurance. So it's actually more liberal than Obamacare in that one regard, right? Yeah, it's different in that one regard, and it'd be more liberal in that one regard. Mm -hmm. So do you want to come at this from another perspective than liberal, or is this going to be all liberal no. perspective? Uh, now, how is it different from the way a conservative would look at it? Yeah, go ahead. No, I dare you to. to uh, I, don't, I don't. It's a state program as opposed to a federal program. Is that, does that have any constitutional dimensions? Do you think? Uh, undoubtedly so. I mean, oh, but the Supreme quite a, Court quite didn't a think so by a five to four vote. Look, the Supreme Court hasn't you know, gotten all of its cases right, just the ones I've handled. So if you were an, a citizen of Massachusetts, would you have supported no. Romney's plan? No. 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 Why not? Because I think it is too much government and too much government uh, uh, directed health care. Mm -hmm. And I think we need to move away from that uh, to a more privatized uh, version. I think the government intervention has been distorting the health care system, made it more expensive, made it less responsive, and uh, that we had got to get away from it. Was, it. was it hard for you to make the decision to uh, support Mitt Romney? There were more cons conservative candidates in the field during the last election cycle. Why, why Mitt Romney? Well, there's, uh, I, I originally supported him uh, four, four years before. So uh, I supported him the last two presidential races. So is it just habit? <laughs> I, I wouldn't think so, would you? I don't think, but I mean, I, but there is an interesting question there. Is there not? I mean, you could have gone with Gingrich. You could have gone with uh, Michelle Bachman. I, 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 you could have gone with Santorum. For people that are really interested in this, I wrote an article for National Review explaining exactly why I was supporting uh, Mitt Romney and dealing with the, uh, you know, uh, Romney care and right. and other issues. That, and, and, that and, and for that matter, abortion. I mean, he was until 2002 that he, he was a Mitt, he was a pro-life governor. Well, I think there was a, it wasn't until he was until a pro-life governor. He didn't do a single thing in a very unequivocal way. Well, uh, yeah, came out as a that was the first politician. issue that he had to deal with yeah. as governor. Yeah. And he, uh, uh, and he said, I'm going to be a pro-life governor, and he was. Okay, but with the benefit of hindsight, mm -hmm. uh, do you think one of the other candidates would have been a better candidate? No. You don't? No, I don't think any of the other candidates would have done better than he did. No, I don't. Uh -huh. um, after you know Mitt Romney's defeat, the, the conventional wisdom, I think, and, and and I think one has to italicize the words conventional wisdom. Yeah, I think that's. But, a joke. <laughs> but uh, the conventional wisdom. Usually, wis what the New York Times and Washington Post has to Wall say. Wall Street about Journal the, too. Wall Street well, Journal. Their and, editorial you know, Fox page. Fox News. Uh, the, the conventional wisdom could not simultaneously be what the Washington Post and New York yeah. Times says and what the Wall Street Journal editorial. Page. Okay. Okay. <laughs> that could not happen because they're on the opposite. Size, there's, so. You know, there's a blue moon every so often. So, there you know, uh, I know of one, you know, <laughs> immigration right now. Uh, but, that's right. but that conventional wisdom was <laughs> that to win future elections, the Republican Party has to strike a more moderate tone, at, at least with respect to some issues. Like, for example, you're already shaking your head, but I'll, I'll complete that's the sentence. That's a liberal co like, comment. Like immigration reform, you totally disagree with that analysis. I disagree with the point of view that the Republican Party has to change its philosophy in order to be successful politically, definitely. And, and you're going to see the truth of that statement next year. What about same-sex marriage? You know, as you know, there are now uh, 13 states in this country that have legalized same-sex marriage. Uh, the Supreme Court uh, has ruled that the Defense of Marriage Act uh, is unconstitutional. Um, 
it's hard for me to imagine uh, that social conservatives can, in the long run, win on this issue. But but let me ask you a more fundamental question. What does it have to do with it? Well, I'm not sure that it has anything to do with it except, okay. uh, you know, you know, winning matters to some and people. Well, marriage and is between a man and a woman. That mm -hmm. was the way it was designed. And, uh, and that, and that uh, it was the way it works best. And it works best both for the society because it's a, it's a, 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 a compatible unit that obviously is based in biology. Uh, and secondly, that it's the best uh, place to raise children. And uh, so it's the best uh, n n n nucleus, if you will, to, to build a society upon uh, if you want to have a, a healthy society and a successful society. Do you think the recognition of same-sex marriage is a threat to all that? Yes, it's, it's shown that it undermines uh, the legitimacy and it undermines even the uh, people's interest in marriage. Uh, when, when, yes, I mean, uh, marriage rates are lower in, for instance, in countries that have recognized same-sex marriage long enough ago to be meaningful, like right. Sweden. Let me ask you this, you know, uh, Dick Cheney, conservative guy, certainly he's the sort of... I don't agree with everything that Dick sure, Cheney ever sure, did, you know sure. that? Okay, let me... Let me can, let, I, can I say let, that let, in the future, okay. any, any politician you, may, you name, okay. there will be something I don't agree with. Grant, you know, okay. Point well taken. Okay, uh, so can we talk about something else? But certainly, well, let me, let me complete the question. You know, he <laughs> he uh, certainly is the sort of conservative that liberals love to hate, but he also happens to have a daughter who is lesbian. And last year, she got married to her longtime partner, and uh, Dick Cheney expressed nothing but affection and acceptance and embraced that relationship. So put, your shall, put yourself in Dick sh uh, Cheney's shoes for a moment. Let's say you have a daughter who's lesbian, and she uh, is telling you that she wants to marry her longtime partner, and she wants your blessing. Mm -hmm. What do you say to her? I can't put myself in that position. That's presumptuous of me. I wouldn't do that. Mm -hmm. It's absurd. You couldn't imagine that? No, I have three daughters, I, and then they're heterosexual. So, no, I can't imagine that, uh, you know, how, how, uh, how uh, I can't put myself in Dick Cheney's shoes, which is what you asked me to do. Yeah. What I can say is, is that you can, uh, you know, your children, uh, do, make choices you wouldn't make. They also do things that you wouldn't do, and they also do sometimes things that you think are absolutely wrong. That doesn't mean you don't love them. Mm -hmm. You know, and that doesn't mean also that you accept what they did. Right. Okay? Right. Uh, you could still love them, not accept what they did, and, uh, uh, and that's a perfectly consistent and, and loving and parent, a proper parental position. Mm -hmm. You don't just because your child wants to do X, that doesn't mean you change your, your view on X and say, well, okay, fine. Given what you're saying, I'm wondering if you can imagine, say, a, a daughter asking you for her blessing, for, for your blessing in that situation. Um, do you have any idea what you would say? I would not support them getting married. If that's the question. Mm -hmm meaning uh, I wouldn't endorse them getting married. Mm -hmm. I mean, then in fact, there are other people or, th or, uh, or situations in which they might consider getting married that I also wouldn't endorse or support and urge them not to do it, okay? Mm -hmm. Now, does that mean I won't love them? Of course I'll love them. Mm -hmm. and, and I'll respect the, the relationship that they have with whoever it is that they have it with, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. Okay. You know, after the, uh, to switch gears just a little bit, after the 2012 uh, election, uh, the, you gave an interview to the uh, Terre Haute Tribune Star, and uh, you were quoted as saying that in order for Republicans to uh, win the next election, they needed to get more personal 
in their attacks against Democrats. And let me read you the quote. You said, quote, while we prefer to talk about policy and principles, the Democrats prefer in many instances to mischaracterize people on a personal level, on a character level. The Republican Party has to learn to deal with that. We have to learn to defend ourselves from it. We also have to learn that because so many voters consider personal attributes to be important, we have to talk about personal attributes of Democrats and liberals. So mm -hmm. I guess, you know. Um, there's a lot of voters that yeah. care about those things more right. than they do policy. So here's the thing. And, um, and, and in, a certain, in a certain level, we, we should all care about them. Yeah, I guess the reason why I was drawn to that quote is because over the years, I haven't noticed that Republicans are uh, reticent about launching personal attacks against Democrats, whether it's uh, the swift boats against Kerry or the birthers talking about Barack Obama. What, what am I missing? Well, you're not missing anything that a liberal, little liberal would have seen. Okay. I mean, this is great. You're in your classic. Good. You know, so tell me what I'm missing. You are classic. Tell me what I'm missing. This is, this is a... a the, you, you, you think that Republicans are too reticent about attacking I'll Democrats? Explain, uh, let me explain it. Okay. The, uh, because the Good. liberals is, uh, have a fallacy, okay? Mm -hmm. And, and uh, the, the, the way the normal debate goes mm -hmm. is, uh, and you could see this in, in Romney and Obama, uh, what, what Romney does is he does ads that says uh, Obama passed Obamacare, and Obamacare is bad. Obama has an article, I mean an ad, that says Mitt Romney's a bad person because he won't talk to his garbage collector. And here's his garbage collector, and he puts him on. He's, you I know, didn't I collect that his... ad. Did they, did they yes. run a garbage collector ad? Did they really run a garbage collector yeah, ad? Yeah, they ran a garbage one. collector ad. Really? Yeah, I didn't and he see said, that I've one. been collecting garbage in front of his mansion for years, and he's never come out and said thank you. And who put this? Was it a, the, a super PAC or was it no, Obama's campaign? No, it was the Obama's campaign. Really? I've got to check that out. Yeah. Yeah. And so. Now, but liberals, yes, because, you point at me. Yes, you've got liberals me like you. Yes, <laughs> liberals like you view a, a, an attack on your policy positions as a personal attack. Well, so you, so you would view yeah. somebody attacking Obamacare as make and associating with you, yeah, as being a personal attack upon no, you. No, I, I, I wouldn't. And yes, well, wouldn't. you may not because you have this one difference among See, all you liberals. Like, yeah, okay, <laughs> so you agree with me on one thing. Read Thomas <laughs> exactly. Read Thomas Sowell's book on the vision of the anointed, and yeah. it explains how liberals view the world. Liberals view the world as uh, them having good motives. And wanting to and and being judged on their motives. Right. All right. So so a debate over welfare would go like this. Uh, the, the 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 liberal would say we need more welfare because you know we, we want to help these people. The, right. The, the, the conservative would say well yeah but the 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 programs the welfare programs you have are not helping them they're making them more dependent and less this and less that and and and, and the liberal would interpret that as an attack on their <laughs> motives because they were trying to help yeah. them, yeah. and they would say, uh, you know, oh, you know, you're attacking me personally, I, you know, uh, you must be, and th then, of course, they also then s s say, think that, well, their motives, the conservatives' motive must be evil, or they would support the same policy that the good-hearted liberal yeah. wants to support. The birther thing had nothing so to do with it. So that's why yeah. liberals view yeah. policy uh, debates as a personal attacks Conservatives don't. Yeah. Liberals do. And so every ad any conservative has ever done has right. always been a personal attack, even though the vast majority of them are policy attacks. Yeah. That's the difference. I think there's an element of truth to what you're saying because folks are sensitive. But the birther thing, there was no policy involved in that, a policy issue involved in that, was there? Well, I think there was a constitutional provision. Do, 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 you know, I know you're trying to make me defend every yeah. crazy okay. uh, conservative idea. So you, you idea acknowledge it's crazy? Huh? You acknowledge that the birther thing was crazy? I, because there's no evidence for it, it's right. crazy. Right. Okay, to be pursuing right. when there's no evidence. Conservatives tend to portray government programs as cultivating dependency. Correct? I think that's a description of their effect. But 
that's not the only thing they do. Don't they, at, at, on occasion, enable people to reach their potential? Like, for example, the GI Bill after probably, World War II? Probably, uh, it's probably not just so. about dependency. It's about enabling people to reach their potential. Well, but the point is, is what's the, the, the predominant effect? And the top predominant effect, particularly the bigger the program gets, and the more people it encompasses. GI it Bill is a huge program, right? It, 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 uh, uh, yeah, but I, I, I think there's differences with the GI Bill that, than, the, than the normal welfare program. That wasn't picked out because of need. That, that was picked out because of service to the country in the Army, mm -hmm. in the Air Force, etc. Mm -hmm. So th that was a completely different category of people. They weren't being picked out by need. How do, how do you feel about Medicare? I think it would be a lot better privatized, and uh, it'd be a lot, you know, I think it's distorted the medical system. Will, will a Republican candidate for president ever say waste. that going forward, do you think? I hope. I hope. Well, either that or, or, or we'll never recover. Uh huh. So, in that sense, I mean, you're we a man. Never, you're a, we you, may never recover. You're a man of principle, and yet you are involved in the political process. You're you're very yeah. active. You've got to swallow a lot to do what you do, don't you? Yeah, but I'm not unidimensional. <laughs> if you haven't noticed. But I mean, you play. You you know that there's a game to be played. That I don't not consider just it a game, principle. but I consider it to be a different arena than my church or theology or just fil fil philosophy. It's, mm -hmm. uh, it's practical. And you got to be practical. Yes, you have to be because it's a you're in a practical world. Mm -hmm. And uh, you, you can never get everything you want and nothing is ever perfect. Let's go back to campaign uh, finance. Uh, so much of the work that you've done over the years is to uh, distinguish between what's called issue advocacy uh, versus political advocacy. And that fight gets broken down into what is a sham issue ad, what is a real issue ad, what is express advocacy, what is the functional equivalent of express advocacy, what is electioneering communication. It all got very murky. But the these were important fights for you to have because, depending how they how they turned out, determined to what extent, if at all, the ad in question was subject to government regulation. Right, or being did, prohibited outright. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. did Citizens United get us past all of that? An awful lot of what you just said. Uh -huh. they, they, yes. I mean, what is a functional equivalent is now moot because that was a. Uh, a, a cutting back of the electioneering communication definition and of course that definition has been struck down now and uh, so uh, the blackout period that the co that the Congress had adopted right. where you go to federal prison if you mention the name of a candidate in a broadcast ad in the proximity of an election uh, was struck down by the Supreme Court so uh, also the distinction between uh, express advocacy, actually advocating the election of a candidate or just talking about issues, m many of the reasons why that distinction was important are no longer uh, true now uh, because, again, uh, they, you know, the court said not only can the, the uh, a corporation do issue ads, they can do express advocacy too. Right. So uh, if, if you can do both, you know, the problem before was you could do one but not the other. Well, now you can do both. Mm -hmm. And uh, so the distinction, you know, no longer has the force that it had. Um, back in 2011, I remember that Mitt Romney uh, got into uh, a heated discussion with a, a heckler. I guess that's the best way, the, the most accurate way to describe this, this gentleman. And at a certain point, Mitt Romney said to this gentleman, corporations are people too. That was the quote. <laughs> and uh, I don't think Citizens United explicitly said anything about corporate personhood. No, in fact, they said it's completely irrelevant right. because it was the First Amendment, not the 14th. Right. But the law as it stands now, uh, do you, as you view it, do corporations have the same right to express themselves under the First Amendment as, say, poets, law professors, talk yeah, show hosts? Definitely. 
uh -huh. because all, all of their speech is protected. It's not who it comes from. There are those who argue against corporate por personhood and they say, well, corporations can't love, they can't cry, they can't get married. I personally think that's a weak argument because there are people in my own family who fit that description. <laughs> uh, but here's a notion I, I, I do, uh, I am impressed by, and, and that's uh, shareholder rights. Mm -hmm. and, and to that point, let me ask you, if say you're a shareholder mm -hmm. in a corporation and the CEO draws from the general treasury to support a, uh, a candidate who's pro-abortion, pro-Obamacare, pro-socialism. At the very least, as a shareholder, don't you have the right to know from the CEO where that money is going? No, I don't have a right to Really? It. No. You don't feel you do? No. I mean, I would be interested because I'd want to sell my stock. Uh, or if I figured uh, that uh, this violated, you know, th their fiduciary responsibility to the corporation, uh, where they're wasting corporate assets and not using them for the business purposes or to advance the business purposes of the, of the corporation, well, then they could be sued. And, of course, I'm in the business of su suing people. So, yeah, that would be interesting. Uh, th those would both be interesting on those grounds. But I don't have a right. What, what's my right? Mm -hmm. well, what's, what's the basis of my right? Well, uh, you know, when Justice Kennedy wrote his... I just own a, a, a yeah, you, piece of very, stock, this, and I can yeah. just sell it. But, I mean, you, you're an investor in that company, and so you it don't feel, as an investor, you have, that at the very least, the CEO should have an obligation, let's put it that way, to tell you where this money is going? No, because uh, they, they, they could be doing it for perfectly legitimate business purposes. Well, they could be, they, they, or they may not be. But that's true of everything that they do. But you don't you, even feel... Whether you... they pay for a, going to a conference, yeah. you know, are they doing it to play golf, or are they doing it because they're yeah. going to go to the, the, the sessions? I mean, everything they do can be second-guessed, and we have a rule that they are governed by. Mm -hmm. They have a fiduciary responsibility as directors and officers, and they, and, the, and they have to do things that uh, are for the business purposes of that corporation, not uh, eleemosynary, not other. And if they do that, they risk uh, paying it back out of their own pocket. So there's a petition, as I'm sure you know, before the SEC now, mm -hmm. filed by a group of law professors to obligate corporations, uh, publicly traded corporations, to disclose to their shareholders where their political spending is going. Yeah. You object, you, you're against that. Yeah, I'm against that. I, I don't think you should burden the political speech of corporations by imposing that requirement. Uh, it's interesting that they're not asking labor unions to do the same thing, uh -huh. which shows the partisan agenda that we've been discussing really now since the very beginning. Yeah. Since you acknowledged at the beginning that it's what also labor unions yeah. that benefited from Citizens United. The liberals and the Democrats are only complaining about corporations because well, it's a partisan agenda. You go back to Justice Kennedy's opinion. Uh, one of the reasons clearly why he was comfortable with the idea of letting corporations spend what they wanted on elections was his faith in what he called the, the procedures of corporate democracy. But how can you have any faith in those procedures if some of this, some or most or much of this money that's being spent uh, is being spent without the knowledge of the shareholders. They don't notify me when they go to a, to a conference, and it could be to play golf rather than go to the well, seminars. It, you know, they don't notify me when they give money to the Brennan Center, uh, the campaign finance people. They don't notify me when they give money to these outfits mm -hmm. right here, mm -hmm. to Hastings Center, and in the Hastings Law School, and the California Lawyer. They don't notify me of any of that. Well, it, any of it could be not for a business purpose. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Any, any of, it, of it is possible. And so once you acknowledge that political spending can fit within the business purpose of a corporation, well then, it's just another thing that they spend money, they could spend money on under that rule. And if they violate that rule, they're going to be reaching in their back pocket to reimburse the corporation. Are you an absolute? Yeah. When it comes to the First Amendment, would you describe yourself as an absolutist? No, I would describe the First Amendment as written in absolute terms. Mm -hmm. Congress shall, think of this, think about this for a second. Congress shall make no law abridging the freedom of speech. Now, if they really wanted Congress to make no law, how would they have written it? 
what would they have said? It's to, if, if not that, tell me what they would have said. Yeah. We really, really mean that Congress shall make no law, or, we, or Congress shall really, really, really not make any law. I mean, they, they wrote it in absolute terms. Well, now, because, you know, because we, we have a doctrine that recognizes that there are compelling governmental interests, so there's like really rare and extreme situations where like yelling, uh, uh, ye falsely yelling fire in a crowded theater, okay? If you did that, you could, you, you know, you would say, well, that speech, no law means I can say that, and, and the courts would throw you in jail and because you, uh, because you uh, committed crimes, and there's a compelling governmental interest to do that. Right. So these are really extreme situations that the courts have recognized, co that life is very complicated and, and, and all that, and, and uh, in, in rare instances, uh, some of these uh, provisions that seem categorical or absolute uh, give way. But we've, because life is complicated. But, but we've gone so far from extreme yeah. situations like um, like publishing in the New York Times the travel schedule of the convoy during World War II, you know, uh, that would be another example where uh, they whacked some newspapers uh, and they defended on the First Amendment and they said, well, those are compelling governmental interests. Uh, the, we're so far from there to where we are now, it's, you know, I mean. So when people express the concern just generally that my elected officials are overly influenced by money, um, is that in your mind a legitimate concern? I don't even know what that means. It's like, the Number you know, one, money, other than contributions, which they're not talking about. Yeah. Uh, because we have contribution limits. Uh, well, it's a kind of crazy situation. I mean, what the system says now is that if I say contribute directly, what three? What's the limit on direct contributions? Twenty five hundred bucks. Twenty six hundred in the federal. So system. if I contribute three thousand bucks directly to a candidate. Twenty six hundred. Well, I'm saying three thousand. I'm giving. Oh, you, oh, I'm, oh, I'm putting some leeway. I'm sorry. Three thousand. I'm, I'm, I'm adding a few more hundred to it. Sorry about that. There's a serious danger there of quid pro quo corruption, right? Yeah. But That's if I give a billion dollars to a super PAC supporting that candidate, no problem. It seems to me it's that doesn't pass the straight face test on both counts. You disagree? No, I agree with half of what you said. <laughs> the billion uh, dollars you don't, agree. Have, you, you don't have any problem that you don't you don't have to worry I about agree. that billion dollars. I agree that you cannot even buy a Democrat congressman for three thousand dollars. We've spent so much time here focusing on, you know, the regulation of money in an election. And, you know, another, an alternative to that, it seems to me, is focusing instead on what these elected folks do once they're in office. You know, maybe it means uh, that judges should recuse themselves more often. Maybe it means in Congress slowing down the revolving door in which, where we see so many uh, You Congress think there's too much information out there? Is that your problem? You think well, no, I'm not, I'm, I'm asking, you know, I'm talking, we're not talking about information, now we're talking about yeah. behavior. And and whether or not some of these proposals that have been suggested uh, to limit the behavior of, well, for example, you know, uh, it has been proposed, uh, Jack Abramoff, now he's a born-again reformer, he's proposing all these things, yeah, but he's, uh, he's saying that, uh, you know, we should have a law that says that lawmakers shouldn't take money from the industries they regulate. Bad idea? They wouldn't be ra raising much money now, would they? Well, I, I, well, I, with Obamacare, every every individual in the United States is being regulated. Well, it, it, as far I, as their health care is concerned, so then then they couldn't you couldn't take contributions from any person, uh, any individual. I, I guess what I'm asking, you know, you go back to they're uh, all subject to taxes. Yeah, yeah. I mean, who? So you who just would say, be you're left? saying that it, it would be impossible to have such a law that it would just it would it, it would. Uh, just make things much, much harder un and unreasonably so to Well, the people money. that have tried it, and there's a few that have tried this, yeah. they, they usually paint with such a broad brush, it doesn't make any sense. And, and that's what I'm suggesting. I mean, as, 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 uh, 
you know, uh, I mean, I mean, th this is a, a potentially more fruitful area to discuss, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, because there, uh, the, but there are still constitutional considerations, and one of them is that uh, the form of government that we have contemplates that public officials will be influenced. We contemplate that. That is that is considered to be a a good thing about our system. Is it the public, people that are active in the public, people that will talk about what they are doing in office and be concerned about it or or happy about it, whatever the case may be? Yeah. That that all of that will influence. You would hope that they would be influenced on the merits. No. As opposed to the money. No. It'll 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 influence people to do the public well. I mean, to use an analogy, let's say you have an illness and you're going to a doctor and there are several treatment options for this illness. And, uh, but but you, you certainly would not want your doctor to automatically go to the treatment option that is manufactured by a company that sends him t to Tahiti every year, right? Do, do you think that doctors are similarly situated to public officials, elected public officials, the, the, or should be? The, the question is the people that we put our trust in. See, we don't want them to be overly influenced by money. I, can I apologize for calling you a liberal? <laughs> you're a progressive. Okay. okay. You, you're concept of democracy is these people are experts, they're like doctors, that we're going to empower them to yeah. make decisions, not let anybody influence them. Now, we put them in a, you know, ivory tower someplace, put, be, they'll be our platonic guardians, maybe they'll, you'll let us vote on them every, you know, from time to time, but we certainly shouldn't do anything to influence them, because absolutely, after, all, after all, they're the elites, they're, they know better than us, they're in the government, they'll decide for us. See, I don't share that conception. I, I share the Jacksonian conception uh -huh. of popular sovereignty. Is that the, It's the consent of the people, all right? And that it is a good thing that public officials are influenced by popular will. Yeah. Now, as imperfectly as that can be expressed, you know, and, and true, there are imperfect ways of expressing it, which means if I don't like the way somebody's getting influenced, I gotta get in there and, and, and try to fix that, not pass a law to prohibit them, mm -hmm. you know, and, make, make, and wipe out your and my influence and all the people's influence, which is where the reformers are going. We just wipe out everybody's influence and just leave it, what, to the New York Times? Are we gonna let them write ed editorials? Yes, we are, or no, we're not. Uh, because there are, there are some people that seem to vote only in accordance with what the New York Times says. Uh, who are those people? Uh, they're liberals, they're, for they're sure. They're not people that I would associate with. Yeah, I'm afraid they are. <laughs> How about, the, well, I in fear response they are. to your, uh, but, uh, your accusation or compliment <laughs> that I'm a liberal, I think you, you let, let me, let me uh, uh, raise the name of John Stennis, mm -hmm. Republican. Uh, no, Democrat. Is he a Democrat? Oh, that's right. He was a Southern, he was a Southern Democrat. Mm -hmm. He was chairman of the the uh, Armed Services mm -hmm. Committee. He was. Back in uh, 1982, they it, wanted to I'd do be a... I'd shocked you called him Republican. Yeah, but well, see, I get confused with these Southerners, <laughs> you know. But, uh, you know, in 1982, uh, uh, they asked him to do a fundraiser for all these defense contractors. Um, and he said in response, I can't do it ethically, because as the chairman of this committee, uh, I have the power of life and death over these companies, so I'm not going to put myself in that position to be, appear in, at a fundraiser in front of all these defense contractors. Wouldn't we all be better off if that sense of propriety returned in Congress? Because I don't... No, I, I, th I think what he was saying was, and I respect him for this, yeah. that, that he's personally weak. He's just talking about himself. Uh-huh. You know, I, I will be influenced, and I don't want to be influenced. So it's an I admission of weakness that. in your... People, look, people refuse contributions from certain people. Yeah. I mean, people do this. Yeah. Uh, judges, some uh, rec rec recuse, uh, you know, at fairly uh, modest, for fairly modest reasons, and others hang tough, you know. And, and if they think that they are going to be influenced mm -hmm. inappropriately, well, then they shouldn't do it, whatever it is. That doesn't mean we have to apply the same weak standard or, or assume weak character. Look, I could, I could 
without a blink of an eye go into that fundraiser if I was raising money for myself without a blink of an eye. They wouldn't influence me one iota mm. because I'm motivated by philosophy. Yeah, let, me, let me just ask you uh, one more question. And, and you know, there's a book that I meant to read for this interview uh, that I never got around to reading. It's called uh, uh, The Righteous Mind, Why Good People Are Divided by Politics and Religion. Mm. I, I never got around to reading it, but let's assume that this guy who wrote this book was able to offer documentary proof that there are at least a half a dozen liberals in this country who are really good people, really, really good people. I, I think there's a lot of liberals <laughs> that are good people. Why are you so, the Well, I'm just saying, so since I haven't read the book, I don't want to uh, <laughs> overstate what he found. No, okay. But, uh, you know, so let, let's take that as a given. What do you think, then, is the most important difference between you as a good person and that the, the, those the liberals, whether there there are half a dozen or a dozen of them, what do you think is the most important distinct, distinction between you and them? I've never thought about that for one second because that's not pertinent to my thinking. Hmm. I know it's pertinent to liberal thinking. Who, who's a good person? Liberals are good people. They're, you know, you should, should, so you should agree with them. Uh, that's not pertinent to me. What's pertinent to Conservatives me? Conservatives don't think about what it. You ask what me it, what I think about. Yeah. I told you. I don't think about whether I'm a good person or somebody else is a good person. I, I think about it, when we're talking about politics. I mean, when I was thinking of a wife, I thought I thought about that. Yeah. But in the political and legal sphere, I don't think about that for one second. It, it's all about the issues, the policies. Are they are they good? Good for the country? Are they good for the people that are? Uh, the alleged beneficiaries. When you're thinking uh, about yourself, I mean, do you, do, don't you think, I mean, the question, am I a good person? Am I doing the right no, thing? No, I don't think if I'm a good person. I think it is what I am advocating consistent with yeah. the principles and values that I uh, hold dear and cherish. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's what I think about. I don't think, am I a good person? What does that have to do with it? That would have to do with my, my personal conduct. Yeah. I mean, I try endeavor not to attack people personally. Like, say, you, you know, briefs are now full of one lawyer saying that the other lawyer misrepresented a case. See, that's a personal attack. Mm -hmm. That is, you know, you knew the case said X, you said it said Y, you misrepresented it. When you should have said, and what really happened, no doubt, in most cases, is uh, misstated, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's the difference between you know talking about policy or or law or whatever, uh, and and personal. Yeah, well, you strike me as a principled person, and I dare say you strike me as a good person, even though I don't agree with you on a hundred percent of the things that you say, <laughs> which will make some news. But thank you so much for being here. Well, really that's kind it. of you, and thank you for inviting me.